Hello, I'm Martin L. Shoemaker, one of the authors in Robots Through the Ages, an exciting new anthology coming from Blackstone Publishing, July 25th, edited by Robert Silverberg and Brian Thomas Schmidt. This book is a history of robot stories across the field of science fiction going back more than a hundred years, including three new stories never before seen just for this volume, including one of mine. And I have loved the stories in this volume, and I would like to put together a video reviewing each of the different stories within it and share it with you so that you can see what you can get in this amazing volume. I'm going to start with the introduction by Robert Silverberg, one of our two editors, and a quote from Mr. Silverberg. On a visit to Poland about 15 years ago, I was startled to see, upon emerging from my hotel room, a poster on the wall across the street that was headed with the word Robota in big letters, followed by seven or eight paragraphs in Polish, a language of which I understand about four words. Robota? Robots, was it? Somebody in Warsaw advertising robots for rent? This was in the early years of the 21st century, remember, when the world was not quite as digital as it is now. And robots, to me, were the stuff of science fiction, not commodities to be advertised on wall posters in Poland. I asked a Polish friend. Sorry, he said, no robots here. Robota was simply the Polish word for job or work. The poster was that of an employment agency looking for clients, from Robert Silverberg's introduction. And the amusing thing about that anecdote, for those who know the history of robots, is that in fact the word robot was invented by the playwright Karl Chapek for his play Rossum's Universal Robots. And the word robot in that play comes from the Czech root robota. And so this was a bit of the history of robots turning full circle. Robert Silverberg is a science fiction grandmaster. He has been publishing now for well over 50 years. And he does a whole lot more than just science fiction. Uh, this latest is an example, The Hot Beat is a book he has come out recently in the mystery genre. You can find it, the QR code pictured. So he has a very diversified experience in writing and reading and commenting and has been an editor for some wonderful stories and has also been an author for wonderful stories. I first met his work in the Majapur Chronicles, a series of stories and books about a world that is in a future science fiction setting, but because of the low presence of metal on the world, it is largely a fantasy-like setting, a more medieval setting, even though there are robots and high-tech and spaceships hiding in the background. So he has a lot of experience in the industry and a lot of experience as a reader and helped pick out some of the great classics of robot stories all back through the past century and more. And as he says, it is the fate of most pioneering works to begin to seem quaint as more sophisticated writers revisit their themes. Jack Williamson's With Folded Hands shows us the consequences of surrendering to seemingly benign labor-saving devices. Clifford D. Simic's classic book City depicts a world in which the humans have vanished and the robots are in charge. And Isaac Asimov's The Bicentennial Man deals with the most poignant aspect of Chapek's play, the fact that the robots are human in all respects except that they lack souls, some sort of spiritual core, and yearn to have them. When we read R.U.R. today, we may smile indulgently at some of the simplicities of storytelling, but we must remind ourselves that Chapek, the pioneer, was blazing a trail that generations of science fiction writers would follow, making new discoveries along the way again from his introduction. And we'll see that in some of the stories in this volume, that some of them were pioneers for concepts in robot stories that other authors and other creators built on later. 
Next, in my review of Robots Through the Ages, I want to talk about the first story in the collection, Perfection, by Shannon McGuire. This is one of the three original stories in the volume, and is a story that is time-wise set far earlier than any of the other stories. Because, in fact, as Robert Silverberg talks about in his introduction, the concepts of artificial life forms created by man or created by the gods goes back far, far, far before what we think of today as modern science fiction. And here was our opening. Mother says I am perfect, and so I am to marry the perfect man. Father says I am a pearl beyond price, and so I am to marry the perfect man. On this they can agree. agree. Their ideas of perfection, however, differ so that I am not certain that they can be reconciled. From the opening story, Perfection. This is a story that harkens back to the Greeks, to the gods, to stories of destiny that plays out in unusual ways. This is a story where the narrator is expected to be perfect, but the definition changes to her detriment. Shannon McGuire writes fantasy under her uh, own, her own name and also science fiction under the pen name Mira Grant. Rosemary and Rue is one of her latest and you can find it at the QR code included here. She has been publishing science fiction and fantasy now for a couple of decades and we are absolutely wonder wonderfully blessed to have her work open up this book. And more from the story. It hurt no more nor less than I expected, which is to say it hurt like I was dying. He lay me out on the table and sliced my hands from the body in one hard stroke, leaving them to fall to the floor. The shock which followed was almost bigger than the pain. I looked at my hands, my dear beloved hands, which had done everything I ever asked of them, and felt a wrenching loss. They were no longer a part of me. One of my fingers twitched as if my hands were bidding me farewell. And then my husband, my handsome, perfect husband, bent over me with something in his hands, still attached, still his own. And I closed my eyes, and the world went away. This is a pretty good snippet of the tone of this story. It is not a happy story. It is a story of someone who is at the mercy of others' definitions of herself and trying to make her more what they want her to be. And what this will lead to in the end will be surprising for her, for them, and for you as the reader. Next in my video review of Robots Through the Ages, is A Night at Moxon's by Ambrose Bierce, also published under the title Moxon's Master. It opens like this. Are you serious? Do you really believe that a machine thinks? I got no immediate reply. Moxon was apparently intent upon the coals in the grate, touching them deftly here and there with the fire poker till they signified a sense of his attentions by a brighter glow. For several weeks I had been observing him in a growing habit of delay in answering even the most trivial of commonplace questions. His air was, however, that of preoccupation rather than deliberation. One might have said that he had something on his mind. Again from A Night at Moxon's. Ambrose Bierce was famous in his day for a number of things. He was a pioneering journalist. He was a literary writer of some repute, and he was also known for his fantasy work. He was an early fantasist in the tradition of what today we might call urban fantasy or modern fantasy, not necessarily fantasy like the high elves of Tolkien and such, but more strange things happening in the world around us. He was famous for, among other things, his collection, The Devil's Dictionary. 
I first met him in this book, shown here on the left, The Pocket Book of Science Fiction, edited by Donald A. Walheim. If you know your science fiction history, you recognize the name Donald A. Walheim, founder and first editor of Daw Books, and also a writer in his own right. What you may not know is that this particular book was the first science fiction paperback anthology ever published. And it was published as a small pocket book so that it could be easily shipped over to soldiers during World War II and also so that they could keep paper usage down and cost down because of wartime rationing. Uh, Moxon's Master, as the title I know the story by, was the second story in this book after By the Waters of Babylon by Stephen Vincent Benet, another writer who crossed lines back in that time period. And so it is a very early story in my memory because my mother owned a copy of this anthology so Moxon's Master was either the first or second adult science fiction story I ever read. So to learn that I would have a place in an anthology beside Moxon's Master, this was an honor beyond words. It's far more than just I got to appear in this collection with a story I'm proud of. I got to appear beside some of my own personal history and across the rest of the stories, the history of the field. Uh, the QR code on the right may help take you to a copy of this that can be purchased. Uh, don't know how long they'll have one. But it's only available in various used bookstores now. It's a great collection. Some of my favorite stories, partly because they were some of my first, but some of my favorite stories of all time are in here. It's well worth a look. So returning to Moxon. Moxon was speaking with unusual animation and earnestness. As he paused, I heard in an adjoining room, known to me as his machine shop, in which no one but himself was permitted to enter, a singular thumping sound, as of someone pounding upon a table with an open hand. Moxon heard it at the same moment and, visibly agitated, rose and hurriedly passed into the room whence it came. I thought it odd that anyone else should be in there, and my interest in my friend, with doubtless a touch of unwarrantable curiosity, led me to listen intently, though I, have, I am happy to say not at the keyhole. There were confused sounds as of a struggle or scuffle. The floor shook. I distinctly heard hard breathing and a hoarse whisper which said, Damn you! Then all was silent, and presently Moxon reappeared and said, with a rather sorry smile, Pardon me for leaving you so abruptly. I have a machine in there that lost its temper and cut up rough. This was a very early example of the story of the conflict between the robot and its creator. And so this story may seem familiar even if you've never read it because so many other creators have read it or have built upon its influence without even knowing it themselves. As science fiction grandmaster Larry Niven says, science fiction is in a conversation with itself. Later writers build upon the work of earlier writers and add their own perspective to it and you'll see that across this collection. So A Night at Moxon's or Moxon's Masters I know it is the opening of the historical stories in this volume. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is With Folded Hands by Jack Williamson. It opens as follows. Underhill was walking home from the office because his wife had the car the afternoon he first met the new mechanicals. His feet were following his usual diagonal path across a weedy vacant block. His wife usually had the car. And his preoccupied mind was rejecting various impossible ways to meet his notes at the Two Rivers Bank when a new wall stopped him. The wall wasn't any common brick or stone, but something sleek and bright and strange. Underhill stared up at a long new building. He felt vaguely annoyed and surprised at this glittering obstruction. 
It certainly hadn't been here last week. Then he saw The Thing in the Window from With Folded Hands by Jack Williamson. And that thing in the window, of course, is going to be his challenge. Jack Williamson wrote great number of stories back in the golden age of science fiction and also had a number of his stories adapted for science fiction radio. I first knew this particular story as an episode of Dimension X, one of two classic science fiction radio stories from the Golden Age. The other was X-1. These two programs adapted many classic science fiction stories from Astounding Science Fiction uh, and other science fiction magazines of the day. And I heard with folded hands in that collection the version that would made the radio since it's only I believe a half hour program is significantly abridged from the version that's in here but it is very entertaining if you like ominous cautionary tales and this particular one is a cautionary tale that we keep reliving the consequences yet today with concerns over artificial intelligence in writing and art so there was some prescience there. The QR code on the right should help you to find uh, the original Dimension X broadcasts, and you may enjoy Jack Williamson's With Folded Hands and many, many others in that collection. And here we start to see Underhill's challenge as it rises up. Underhill sighed wistfully. The Android company didn't supply such fetching sales material. Women would find this booklet irresistible, and they selected 86% of all mechanicals sold. Yes, the competition was going to be bitter. Take it home, sir, the sweet voice urged him. Show it to your wife. There's a free trial demonstration order blank on the last page, and we'll notice that we require no payment down. He turned numbly, and the door slid open for him. Repeating dazedly, he discovered the booklet still in his hand. He crumpled it furiously and flung it down. The small black thing picked it up tidily, and the insistent silver voice rang after him. We shall call at your office tomorrow, Mr. Underhill, and send a demonstration unit to your home. It is time to discuss the liquidation of your business, because the electronic mechanicals you have been selling cannot compete with us, and we shall offer your wife a free old free trial demonstration. The mechanicals are coming, and Underhill can't stop them. The next story in Robots Through the Ages is Good Night, Mr. James by Clifford D. Simak. He came alive from nothing, the story opens. He became aware from unawareness. He smelled the air of the night and heard the trees whispering on the embankment above him, and the breeze that had set the trees to whispering came down to him and felt him over with soft and tender fingers, for all the world as if it were examining him for broken bones or contusions and abrasions. He sat up and put both his palms down upon the ground beside him to help him sit erect and stared into the darkness. Memory came slowly, and when it came it was incomplete and answered nothing. I love Simak's writing. It is somewhere just on the edge of poetry, and this is an excellent example of it. Clifford D. Simak, another great of the golden age of science fiction, is perhaps best known for most of us through his City collection, a bunch of stories of the future of humanity as focused on a particular city and its residents over time, including one particular robot who is a witness to the development and evolution of the city. Um, it is a spiritual antecedent for many of the robot stories that came later. Some have said that mine reminded them of Simak, which was surprising to me because I was a little delinquent. I didn't read Simak until fairly recently. So it was an honor once I understood what they were saying. Um, so Simak has a connection to robots that goes back very far in city, and the QR code on the right can help you find a copy. 
this particular story is a robot story, but has no connection to City or to the robot of that story. You fool, the dying poodly said, death clouding its words as they built up in his mind. You fool, you half thing, you duplicate. It died then and he felt it die, felt the life go out of it and leave it empty. He rose softly to his feet and he seemed stunned and at first he thought it was from knowing death, from having touched hands with death within the poodly's mind. The poodly had tried to fool him. Faced with the pistol, it had tried to throw him off his balance to give it the second that it needed to hurl the mind-blasting thought that had caught at the edge of his brain. If he had hesitated for a moment, he knew it would have been all over with him. If his finger had slackened for a moment, it would have been too late. This sounds like a climax, but it's actually early in Good Night, Mr. James. The Mr. James of the title awakens hunting the poodly, an alien menace from another world that he accidentally unleashed upon Earth. And so it's his responsibility to stop it. But in stopping it, he discovers an identity crisis, and he's going to have to learn who truly is the hunter here and who is the prey. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is Instinct by Lester Del Rey. It opens as follows. Sen 3 waved aside the slowing scooter and lengthened his stride down the sidewalk. He had walked all the way from the rocket port and there was no point to a taxi now that he was only a few blocks from the biolabs. Besides, it was too fine a morning to waste in riding. He sniffed at the crisp, clean fumes of gasoline appreciatively and listened to the music of his hard heels slapping against the concrete. It was good to have a new body again. He hadn't appreciated what life was like for the last hundred years or so. He let his eyes rove across the street toward the blue flame of a welding torch and realized how long it had been since his eyes had really appreciated the delicate beauty of such a flame. The wise old brain in his chest even seemed to think better now. It was worth every stinking minute he'd spent on Venus. At times like this, one could realize how good it was to be alive and to be a robot. Instinct comes to us from Lester Del Rey, another pioneering writer of the golden age of science fiction, and also known very well as an editor with his wife Judy Lynn Del Rey, they became the leading editors of Ballantine Books' science fiction imprint, Del Rey Books. So their name was put on hundreds of science fiction books through the years where they were editors or line editors, but they started as writers. And Lester Del Rey first came to my attention with the book The Runaway Robot, which was supposedly written by him. Uh, historians say, in fact, he plotted it and a ghostwriter wrote it. I didn't know any of that when I was 10 years old reading my battered copy of The Runaway Robot, a story of a boy getting sent home from one of the moons of Jupiter. It might have been Saturn. It's been a long time since I read this. But getting sent home he can't take his robot with him. And so he has to go on the ship back to Earth and the robot is abandoned and discovers he doesn't like where his working conditions are now and wants to flee and find his boy. And that boy, coincidentally enough, maybe it was in the back of my head, that boy was Paul. So I find some amusement that my story Today I Am Paul, which is my first major robot story, has this conceptual tie back to one of the first robot stories I ever read. And now I'm in a collection with Lester Del Rey with the story Instinct, which we know he really did write this one. The QR code on the right can help you track down a copy of Runaway Robot if you're interested in a juvenile science fiction story from more than 50 years ago. Returning to Instinct, he probably knew some of it, Senthry thought. They all got part of it as legends. 
He leaned back in his seat now, though, as the biochemist began the old tale of the beginning as they knew it. They knew that there had been a man, been man a million years before them. And somebody, Asimov or Asenian, the record wasn't quite clear, had apparently created the first robot. They had improved it up to about the present level. Then there had been some kind of a contest in which violent forces had ruined the factories, most of the robots, and nearly all of the men. It was believed from the fragmentary records that a biological weapon had killed the rest of man, leaving only the robots. Those first robots, as they were now known, had had to start on a ruined world from scratch, a world where mines were exhausted and factories were gone. They'd learned to get metals from the sea and had spent years and centuries slowly rebuilding the machines to build new robots. There had been only two of them when the task was finished, and they had barely time enough to run one new robot off and educate him sketchily. Then they had discharged finally, and he had taken up rebuilding the race. It was almost like the beginning with no history and no science. Twenty millennia had passed before they began to rebuild a civilization of their own. But why did man die, Sen3 asked. This becomes the central background and the goal of Instinct by Del Rey. That these robots exist in a world that they know had a history that began with man. Notice also the nod to Isaac Asimov, who was one of the pioneering robot authors of the Golden Age. We'll come back to him. But they don't understand what man was and powers that humanity had that they lack. That they are all about their logics, but humanity could do other things beyond logic. And this story is their attempt to understand those things through scientific means. And the ending delighted and surprised me. I didn't see it coming, and it was a perfect fit. Next up on Stories from Robots Through the Ages is A Bad Day for Sales by Fritz Lieber. It opens as follows. The big bright doors of the office building parted with a pneumatic whoosh and Roby glided onto Times Square. The crowd had been watching the 50-foot tall girl on the clothing billboard get dressed or reading the latest news about the hot truth squall itself in a yard-high script hurried to look. Roby was still a novelty. Roby was fun. For a little while yet, he could steal the show. But the attention did not make Roby proud. He had no more emotions than the pink plastic giantess, who dressed and undressed endlessly whether there was a crowd or the street was empty, and who never once blinked her blue mechanical eyes. But she merely drew business, while Roby went out after it. And so opens a bad day for sales by Fritz Lieber, a science fiction grandmaster, very prolific author in his time, known more for his fantasy than his science fiction. His stories of Fofford and the Gray Mouser are foundational for what some might call low fantasy. It's not the fantasy of high wizards and high elves deciding the high destiny of the world. It is the fantasy of people trying to survive on dark, gritty streets in those worlds and trying to find a way to make their fortune and escape those streets and getting in a whole lot of trouble as they do. It's the same general genre as some of the Conan stories, although Conan eventually becomes a king and is working at a different level, but there's still that feel of the low street level understanding of fantasy and magic and steel and challenge. And the QR code on the right can help you find some of Fritz Lieber's sword and sorcery work, some of the early collected Fofford and the Gray Mouser stories. Now for some of the stories in Robots Through the Ages, I also read an excerpt and discuss it, but I'm not going to for this story because it is a short humor piece, and in my judgment there was not a thing I could pull out that would represent the story well and wouldn't ruin the ending, wouldn't rule, ruin the jokes. So I'm going to recommend the story and the opening gave you the little taste that it is a 
hyper-commercialized consumer world where robots get introduced and set out in search of customers. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is Second Variety by Philip K. Dick. And it opens with this. The Russian soldier made his way nervously up the ragged side of the hill, holding his gun ready. He glanced around him, licking his dry lips, his face set. From time to time, he reached up a gloved hand and wiped perspiration from his neck, pushing down his coat collar. Eric turned to Corporal Leon. Want him, or can I have him? He adjusted the view sights. The Russian's features squarely filled the glass, the lines cutting across his hard, somber features. Leon considered. The Russian was close, moving rapidly, almost running. Don't fire. Wait, Leon tensed. I don't think we're needed. The Russian increased his pace, kicking ash and piles of debris out of his way. He reached the top of the hill and stopped, panting, staring around him. The sky was overcast, drifting clouds of gray particles. Bare trunks of trees jutted up occasionally. The ground was level and bare, rubble-strewn, with the ruins of buildings standing out here and there like yellowing skulls. We don't see any robots yet, but we see vivid imagery of the destruction of this world and how robots can be seen coming, let's say. When Leon says, I don't think we're needed, it's because the robots will take care of the Russian for them. This is from Philip K. Dick, an author who a friend recently described as the Van Gogh of science fiction. If you're familiar with Van Gogh as the artist, he was quite a prolific artist, Vincent van Gogh, but he was never appreciated in his time. His brother Theo would try to sell his canvases and could just not find enough buyers to actually make van Gogh successful. It didn't help that van Gogh lived a rather extravagant lifestyle of drinking and other activities that took up a lot of his time and his health and also sometimes fed into his depression to the point where Van Gogh really never understood what he had accomplished. He knew in his head what he was trying to accomplish, but no one appreciated it, and he couldn't see that not long after his death, people would start looking at his art and seeing how great his vision was. I know very few visual artists that I can recognize, but Van Gogh is among my top three favorites of all time. But that didn't come to him in his lifetime. He never knew that was happening. Philip K. Dick was a stylist and a plotter, a visionary, who had his own demons, his own mental health problems, his whole own addiction problems, a lot of things that brought him down. But he was known in the science fiction community for brilliant, beautiful, weird stories that really made him popular with the discerning readers, but weren't enough to ever make him successful in the way he seemed to deserve. And that started to change with a story he wrote called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Which got option for a movie and eventually produced as something you have perhaps run across called Blade Runner. Blade Runner came out just a month or so after Dick's death. But he got to see an early print. He got to see some of the press excitement about it. So unlike Van Gogh, he at least could see that the success was out there. He just tragically didn't live to get it. And since then, Philip K. Dick has become one of Hollywood's favorite writers. Beyond Blade Runner, his stories were the basis for Total Recall, The Man in the High Castle, The Adjustment Bureau, Screamers, Radio Free Albumuth, A Scanner Darkly, Minority Report, 
and many others. He now has an honored place in TV and film science fiction. He also, again, had his admirers in science fiction print going back a long ways, including this Philip K. Dick collection, which a friend of mine owned the paperback copy of it, not this deluxe hardcover. You can get the deluxe hardcover at the QR code on the right. But he had a paperback copy, and he lent it out to me. And that is where I originally read the second variety. So when I read this in the collection of Robots Through the Ages, I was ready for what I was getting. The claws weren't like other weapons. They were alive from any, from any practical standpoint, whether the governments wanted to admit it or not. They were not machines. They were living things, spinning, creeping, shaking themselves up suddenly from the gray ash and darting toward a man, climbing up to him, rushing for his throat. And that was what they had been designed to do, their job. They did their job well, especially lately with the new designs coming up. Now they repaired themselves. They were on their own. Radiation tabs protected the UN troops, but if a man lost his tab, he was fair game for the claws, no matter what his uniform. Down below the surface, automatic machinery stamped them out. Human beings stayed a long way off. It was too risky. Nobody wanted to be around them. They were left to themselves, and they seemed to be doing all right. The new designs were faster, more complex, more efficient. Apparently, they had won the war. If only it were so easy, as our protagonist will find out. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is The Golem by Avram Davidson, which opens with this delightful scene. The gray-faced person came along the street where old Mr. and Mrs. Gumbiner lived. It was afternoon, it was autumn, the sun was warm and soothing to their ancient bones. Anyone who attended the movies in the 20s or the early 30s had seen that street a thousand times. Past these bungalows with their half-double roofs, Edmund Lowe walked arm-in-arm arm with Leatrice Joy and Harold Lloyd was chased by Chinamen waving hatchets. Under these squamous palm trees, Laurel kicked Hardy and Woolsey beat Wheeler upon the head with a codfish. Across these pocket handkerchief-sized lawns, the juveniles of the Our Gang comedies pursued one another and were pursued by angry fat men in golf knickers. On this same street, or perhaps on some, one of, some other one of 500 streets exactly like it. Mrs. Gumbiner indicated the gray-faced person to her husband. You think maybe he's got something the matter? she asked. He walks kind of funny to me. Walks like a golem. Mr. Gumbiner said indifferently. The old woman was nettled. Oh, I don't know, she said. I think he looks like your cousin Mendel. And my apologies, I am not a great voice artist or reader. I did my best to put some distinction into those voices. But I am but a writer. And the author is also a great writer, Avram Davidson, Good for his science fiction, his humor back in the golden age. He wrote this one and numerous others. But I want to talk about the better reading experience you will get in the audiobook of Robots Through the Ages. Because at a certain point, years back, Leonard Nimoy, yes, that Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, recorded this story at a private event. He read it for the audience and it was recorded, and the fine folks at Blackstone Publishing have managed to get rights to that audio for the audiobook of Robots Through the Ages. So now you understand why I'm so excited to be in this volume. I get to be in a book with Moxon's Master by Ambrose Bierce, with Philip K. Dick, with Lester Del Rey, who wrote Runaway Robot, my childhood favorite, and I get to be in an audiobook with Leonard Nimoy. You don't want to hear me read any more of that story. Nimoy does it much better. Get the audiobook at the QR code attached, and you will love this presentation. It made me laugh. 
it was such a good expression of the characters and their humorous points of view. Um, sort of a traditional Jewish humor or sometimes I think Borscht Belt humor. I guess I'm showing my age there that I remember the Borscht Belt. It is a wonderful, wonderful reading that Nimoy did just a fantastic job on. So look for that. Next up in Robots Through the Ages, For a Breath I Tarry by Roger Zelazny. Our story opens as follows. They called him Frost. Of all things created of Salcom, Frost was the finest, the mightiest, the most difficult to understand. This is why he bore a name and why he was given dominion over half the earth. On the day of Frost's creation, Salcom had suffered a discontinuity of complementary functions best described as madness. This was brought on by an unprecedented solar flare-up which lasted for a little over 36 hours. It occurred during a vital phase of circuit structuring, and when it was finished, so was Frost. Salcom was then in the unique position of having created a unique bearing, being during a period of temporary amnesia. And Salcom was not certain that Frost was the project or product originally desired. This is from the award-winning fantasist Roger Zelazny. Another reason why I'm so honored to be in this collection with one of the writers I grew up reading. Particularly, I grew up reading his Amber series. Originally, the Chronicles of Amber, and then expanded into a 10-book set. The books were smaller then. Today, all 10 books get collected into one giant book. Uh, Chronicles of Amber, a wonderful series that is sort of like if you took the traditional British stories of the Fae living in other worlds and having their influences on humanity, but their own wars and struggles, and reimagine that as gritty fantasy. That's Amber, although no one describes it that way. If you look under the hood and look at all the names and look at all the conventions, he has adapted the tropes of traditional British fantasy in some, into something uniquely Zelazny. And you can find that at the QR code indicated. Zelazny was famous for that sort of gritty fantasy, but also for stuff that was more esoteric, more metaphorical and atmospheric. And that is For a Breath I Tarry. The story is straightforward, but the concepts are cosmic. I am sorry, excellent beta machine. I know you are my peer, but this is a problem which I must solve myself. What is sorry? A figure of speech indicating that I am kindly disposed to you, that I bear you no animosity, that I appreciate your offer. Frost, Frost, this too is like the other, an open field. Where did you obtain all these words and their meanings? From the Library of Man, said Frost. Will you render me some of this data for processing? Very well, Beta. I will transmit you the contents of several books of man, including the complete unabridged dictionary. But I warn you, some of the books are works of art, hence not completely amenable to logic. How can that be? Man created logic, and because of that was superior to it. Earlier I mentioned... Larry Niven saying science fiction is in a conversation with itself. Here's a good example. There are some of the same themes and concepts in For a Breath I Tarry by Roger Zelazny as in the earlier work we looked at, Instinct by Lester Del Rey. A world where humanity is gone and robots remain and are trying to understand their history. But Del Rey and Zelazny are very different writers with very different styles. So even though they're attacking the same concept, the approaches are wonderfully different. Definitively Del Rey and definitively Zelazny. And the ending of this one hit me completely out of left field and made me laugh because it's an ending that you see in some other stories but never quite like Zelazny did it. 
Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is Good News from the Vatican by Robert Silverberg, our lead editor in the collection. And it opens like this. This is the morning everyone has been waiting for when at last the robot cardinal is to be elected pope. There can no longer be any doubt of the outcome. The conclave has been deadlocked for many days between the obstinate advocates of Cardinal Asciuga of Milan and Cardinal Carciofo of Genoa, and word has gone out that a compromise is in the making. All factions now are agreed on the selection of the robot. This morning I read in Observatore Romano that the Vatican computer itself has taken a hand in the deliberations. The computer has been strongly urging the candidacy of the robot. I suppose we should not be surprised by this loyalty among machines, nor should we let it distress us. We absolutely must not let it distress us. Every era gets the pulp it deserves, Bishop Fitzpatrick observed somewhat gloomily today at breakfast. The proper pope for our times is a robot, certainly. At some future date, it may be desirable for the pope to be a whale, an automobile, a cat, a mountain. Bishop Fitzpatrick stands well over two meters in height, and his normal facial expression is a morbid, mournful one. Thus, it is impossible for us to determine whether any particular pronouncement of his reflects existential despair or placid acceptance. Many years ago, he was a star player for the Holy Cross Championship basketball team. He has come to Rome to do research for a biography of St. Marcellus the Righteous. And if that strikes you as weird, welcome to Robert Silverberg, who loves to take a concept and explore it and juxtapose it as a way to seeing the meaning behind it for people today and in the future. The idea of a robot pope, story idea enough, but then how Silverberg puts it together is it's told all through the eyes of what's almost the setup for an old joke. A rabbi, a priest, and a minister meet in a bar. Well, okay, they're meeting in a restaurant in Vatican City along with three philosophers of no known particular religious denomination. And we see through the eyes of these different philosophers the implications of this momentous historical event. It's not a big story about battles for worlds. It's not even a big story about people fighting each other over the spoils of a ruined earth. It is a story about humanity's tense tendency towards religious faith and how that tendency changes through the ages. And yet is in many ways timeless. They have finished counting the votes by this time, surely. An immense throng has assembled in the square of St. Peter's. The sunlight gleams off hundreds if not thousands of steel-jacketed craniums. This must be a wonderful day for the robot population of Rome, but most of those in the piazza are creatures of flesh and blood. Old women in black, gaunt young pickpockets, boys with puppies, plump vendors of sausages, and an assortment of poets, philosophers, generals, legislators, tourists, and fishermen. How is the tally gone? We'll have our answer shortly. If no candidate has had a majority, they will mix the ballots with wet straw before casting them into the chapel stove, and black smoke will blow from the chimney. But if a pope has been elected, the straw will be dry, the smoke will be white. And this is part of the wonder of this story, how Silverberg very reverently and lovingly talks through the process of selecting the Pope as we know it from the outside, because none of us can be in there, but we hear reports of the process of the ritual. And the narrator is describing the process as if he were there and could see it in his head, but there's always this side element that you realize, no, he knows no more of what's going on in there than we do. And we're all just waiting to see the results and see how the world will change after that. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is Dilemma by Connie Willis. We want to see Dr. Asimov, the bluish silver robot said. Dr. Asimov is in conference, Susan said. You'll have to make an appointment. She turned to the computer and called up the calendar. 
I knew we should have called first, the varnished robot said to the white one. Dr. Asimov is the most famous author of the 20th century and now the 21st, and as such he must be terribly busy. I can give you an appointment at 2.30 on June 24th, Susan said, or at 10 on August 15th. June 24th is 135 days from today, the white robot said. It had a large red cross painted on its torso and an oxygen tank strapped to its back. We need to see him today, the bluish silver robot said, bending over the desk. I love this opening. It is tongue-in-cheek tribute to Isaac Asimov, one of the pioneering, pioneering robot authors, told by Connie Willis, who herself is a pioneer these days, that she wrote many great stories through the years and was someone who wrote under Asimov at his magazine and was part of his writer family. And this story is such a loving tribute to Asimov stories written in an Asimov style, if you know his work. A pastiche, we call it in the literary world. But a pastiche starring Asimov himself. Connie Willis is another grandmaster. We've got numerous grandmasters in our authors in this collection. Not myself, of course. I'm just a fairly new author. Um, my earliest introduction to her was a story that appeared in, naturally enough, Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. We just call it Asimov's today now that he's passed. A story called All About Emily, which starts as seemingly a satire on old movies about the Broadway star who can't make the performance and the understudy has to come in and fill in and get her chance at the spotlight. And it was amusing that way. And then it kept developing and developing because the replacing dancer was a robot and this caused trouble because some people couldn't stand the thought and others were intrigued by it. But only one person really got to understand what the robot thought of this and became the robot's champion. And the ending was so moving that when I finally met Connie Willis at a Worldcon, I had to stop her in traffic and thank her for such an amazing story. And you can find a Kindle copy of it at the QR code on the right. So this continues as a tribute to Asimov. Yes, sir, Susan said. She finished tying the tie and stepped back to look at the effect. One side of the bowl was a little larger than the other. She adjusted it, scrutinized it again, and gave it a final pat. The Union Club, Asimov said. The Nightfall Room. The coordinates card is in my breast pocket, he said. Yes, sir, she said, helping on with his jacket. No speech, just a few extemporaneous remarks. Yes, sir. She helped him on with his overcoat and wrapped his muffler around his jacket. Janet's meeting me there. Good grief, I should have gotten her a corsage, shouldn't I? Yes, sir, Susan said, taking a white box out of the desk drawer. Orchids and Stephanotis. She handed him the box. Susan, you're wonderful. I'd be lost without you. Yes, sir, Susan said. I've called the taxi. It's waiting at the door. Knowing the whole story, this scene just delights me. It is such a perfect encapsulation of the larger story. A story about what happens when Asimov himself meets robots inspired by his work and they have a boon to beg of him. That they want to be released from his laws just to a small degree so that they can continue to help humanity. And he resolves it in a way that is so classically Asimov with a little bit of almost his Tales of the Black Widower's resolution of gathering all the parties together and querying them and finding the resolution that none of them could see but the good doctor could. Excellent. Once again, Connie Willis, thank you. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is The Robot's Girl by Brenda Cooper. A sad story, but also very deeply felt. 
And in the end, is it really sad? You'll have to decide if it's a happy ending or a sad ending. The door's silent slide still surprised me, even after Alice and I had been moving boxes into our new garage and piling them in unruly heaps for two days. Hair stuck to my neck as sweat ran down the small of my back and the backs of my knees. Our real estate agent had told me it never got hot here, but apparently she lied about the weather as easily as she lied about the closing costs. So we were too broke for household help and hot from humping boxes. But we were here. Home. And done working for the evening. I gathered up a cold beer from the gleaming fridge, which opened and closed for me the same way the front door did, eerily quiet and efficient. I'd grown up with doors you opened and closed with human muscle. My last house had been built green when that meant saving energy instead of producing it. Trust humanity not to waste anything free when you can use a lot of it. There's our opening of a couple moving into their new home. There is just a hint of the futuristic about it in the doors that automatically open for you and supposedly know what you want. But it's going to grow into a story about a little girl raised entirely by robots and how these two humans cannot fathom that and worry about her safety and her happiness. This is written by Brenda Cooper, who is an author and also a poet and works in her day job as a technologist and who has written a number of books, including collaborations with Larry Niven, who I've mentioned in a couple of these other reviews. So she has got good connections to the history of science fiction, including her appearance in this collection. Uh, her Edge of Dark is a recent reprinting of a series that she has written and you can find it at the QR code on the right. And now let's look at when the robots come in and the couple has to deal with them and with the little girl. She swung around in front of me and stopped, blocking my way, head tilted up toward me. It's like she's in jail, but she doesn't know it. What if they've raised her forever? What if that little girl doesn't know what a human hug feels like? What if... What if she thinks she's inferior to those robots? What are they teaching her? Shh! I took her shoulder slightly. She felt like a bird. We have to keep perspective, not get thrown in jail for breaking and entering. The cops won't even go in. You called them. She stared at me, eyes wide, then snapped her mouth shut. I'm sorry, we can't. There's nothing illegal about robot babysitters. They're not babysitters! She thumped her fists against my chest, and her breath overtook her ability to speak, and she actually quivered. I pulled her in and stroked her hair. We have to find another way. This is a story of two different ways of living, and a story of why this little girl is being raised by robots, and can these two people come to understand that and either accept it or find a way to rescue her from it? I won't tell you the answer. I'll let Brenda Cooper surprise you. Our next story from Robots Through the Ages is That Must Be Them Now by Karen Haber. Number 29 watched as three suns sat below the blue rim of Eridne 7 and felt the taste of sour nuglock in his mouth. The remaining sun cast a hard, brassy light upon the purple surface of the planetoid, upon the small brown lump of number 29 and his solitary expe expectations. This was the right place. He had checked the coordinates three times, but there was no sign of those for whom he waited. Whoever they were, he had landed on this dust ball two cycles before, according to the directions he had deciphered from the remnants of an alien device that his grandmother's grapplers had recovered. The device had not matched any of his design references. With growing excitement, number 29 realized that it must have been sent by unknown beings. A new intelligent race on its way to Eridne 7, and only number 29 knew about it. Yeah, right. Number 29 is going to learn differently across, this, the, across the span of this story. This is an interesting opening 
And in some ways, it's reflective of every new scene in the story. As different beings from different races all arrive at this world where number 29 thinks that it is going to be the first to discover this new race and thus earn prestige and influence among its race of robots. This story from Karen Haber. She's an author and a scholar. This is her recent book, Woman Without a Shadow. It's a re-release under her own uh, own imprint. And you can find the book at the QR code on the right. She has written a story which has got light humor to it as it's an attempt at a first contact. But who's going to really make that first contact? And what sort of calamities and accidents and amusing things happen to them along the way. Don't squeal, Jaguar. I doubt that we've actually moved in time, although it is theoretically possible. Number nine was not in the mood number twenty nine was not in the mood to discuss temporal theory with a mech head. His own thorax was steadily rumbling with hunger. He padded across the cinder flecked ground and began to examine the various pieces of machinery that had so recently resided in the rog bat's stomach. What a shame that only part of the Orton scout ship had survived, he thought. The pilot's area had a nasty crack running through it. Number 29 didn't want to think about what had happened to the previous occupant. The damage was centered directly where the pilot would have been sitting, in front of the semicircular thruster control. Despite the damage, the controls looked fairly intact. There was more here than he had thought at first glance. He might have a viable spacecraft, if only he could find something to seal that nasty crack and form a vacuum barrier. So here we see how number 29 and the mech hat, head have been transported to an entirely different planet and disgorged from the rog bat's stomach. And that will all make sense if you read the story and realize how incident piles upon incident with humorous effect. And now number 29 has to get back and hope to be the first to meet this new species. Will it? You'll have to read to find out. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is R.U.R. 8 by Susan Palmer. In Robert Silverberg's introduction, and in my own, we discussed the play Rossum's Universal Robots, R.U.R., by Carl Chapek. It was a foundational story that influenced so many other science fiction robot stories through the years, and particularly this one, which is not a sequel, but it's a thematic sequel going off in a new direction. And, in keeping with the original, it's told as a play. Scene 1, Interior, Helena City. A large, dirty, dim, mechanical space lit only by the very large nuclear furnace that dominates the center of the room. A slow but steady progression of shiny, identical androids enter and exit to tend to the furnace, often either inserting or removing glowing cylinders from its base. They pay no attention to the three decrepit and ancient robots, Quist, Sully, and Rosam, that either lean against or lie near the brightly glowing column. Enter another old robot, Stout. It shuffles into the room and takes a spot leaning against the furnace between Sully and Rosam. Stout. Ah, that feels good. Sully. Where have you been? Stout. I went looking for a new leg for Rosam in the scrap hills outside the city. So far nothing, but I'll try again tomorrow. So this is definitely not the world of Chopex R.U.R., that story ended, spoilers for a play that is a hundred years old now, it ended with new robots, which were more what we might call uh, cyborg state, because they were actually biological creations that looked like humans in every detail. But the new robots had taken over the world, one original human was left, and he didn't have much time left, but he saw hope that maybe these robots would make a better world than humanity had. 
Here we have metallic robots that aren't necessarily very human looking at all, and it's long after the robot wars, and nothing is turning out very well at all. This is from Susan Palmer, who is a Sturgeon Award winner and also a poet. Her most recent work that I found was Finder, and you can find that at the QR code on the right. So let's go back to our robots and their shattered world. Radius. That's too bad. He's likely still bored then. We used to at least have shows to watch, but after a while no one wanted to be bothered to make them. So they repeated the old ones until no one watched. Now you turn on the vid and you can flip through to all the other rooms in the city and watch everyone else sitting bored and watching back. You know what was a hit? Half the city spent three days watching a dead person on level 49 until a service android discovered and cleared the body. That was probably where your man got the idea, and it's probably the only idea he's had in years. There used to be people who believed that if we handed all work over to robots, they would come to replace us in all ways, eventually developing emotions, which has happened in older models, which is why the new androids aren't allowed to persist beyond a safe, short time limit, and that you would rise up to kill us all as useless. Instead, we made you just as bored as we are, and we all grind on into oblivion together. Stout. You don't seem bored. Radius. It is a constant battle. This is the world of RUR8. It has a lot of medical, metaphorical similarity to a world where people today sit and are bored and watch reality TV and don't find anything that's engaging them and exciting them to try to build new. Will Radius be able to explain this to Stout? Will Stout find the leg that Rosin is missing? Will any of them find new purpose? Read RUR8 to find out. Next in our stories from Robots Through the Ages is a relatively recent one, Robinson Calculator by Paul Levinson. A story I loved and I really thought it was one of my favorites in the collection because it's a story much like I might have written with some of the same influences and some of Paul's experience. It felt like a story in, in the spirit I could really understand. I first noticed the name on a headstone in the Woodland Cemetery in the Bronx. Robinson Calculator. I mean, would they be so blatant to bury one of their own under a tombstone which plainly identified the deceased as Calculator? That would bring hiding in plain sight to a whole new level. I'm not making this up. You'd see this with your own eyes if you were in the right spot in the cemetery. I'd understand if you didn't. Most people are only visiting the cemetery because they're grieving for a loved one. But sometimes there's less grief than other times. You know, for a member of the family by marriage, and you didn't really know the old guy all that well. And if there were no tears in your eyes and you looked in the right place, trust me, you'd see that name incised in stone too. Robinson Calculator. Paul tells me in discussions we had that, in fact, there really is such a tombstone. And this story was his attempt to explain that. And in the process, he created a fascinating new world. Because Paul's a pretty bright guy. Besides being an author, he's also a professor of media and communication sciences and a frequent commentator on various news shows on the subject of communication and technology and science and science fiction and the future. Here's one of his most recent works, The Plot to Save Socrates. You can find that in the QR code on the right. And so he is building a world where, without us knowing it, advanced robots have been around for decades, maybe centuries, and our narrator happens to be aware of this because his ex-sister-in-law was one of them. I was a professor of philosophy and a filmmaker, but also an amateur historian. Maybe not so amateur. The history of knowledge, an intrinsic part of epistemology, was inevitably a study of history, too. 
I and many others had always wondered about the spark that had gotten our civilization going. The Chinese, the Arabs, many cultures had made great discoveries and accomplished great things. But there's something about the Greek and Roman combination that had ultimately ignited the science and technology that had lifted us off this planet, had cracked the code of life, and yeah, had created apps which certainly had a lot of the characteristics of human intelligence. Apps that answered questions, provided instructions. Apps you could practically fall in love with if you weren't careful. So Paul is planting a lot of seeds and raising a lot of questions as the story goes along. And in the end, he'll answer some of them and some he won't. And I've asked him if there's more to this story and he says, there may be coming. So I'm hoping this is a tease. But in the meantime, enjoy Robinson Calculator, which stands well on its own and will leave you wanting more. Our next story in Robots Through the Ages is of Homeward Dreams and Fallen Seeds and Melodies by Moonlight by Ken Scholes. I'm not a fan of long titles myself in, generally, in general, but that one has got poetry to it. It has got music to it. So I'll take it. And it's reading it aloud that I realized exactly how much it captures the spirit of the story which opens as follows. Tovin the far seer climbed his mountain alone to his solitary watch. Each foot fell heavily upon the worn stone as he traced the path of his father and his grandmother before him. Each morning the same. Pray and then watch. And again each evening. Watch and then pray. Tovin sighed and felt the weight of his life with each step he took. Around him, the air took on the chill of an early winter, and the sky was overcast, promising a cold rain later. The moon, in all its blue-green glory, was hidden now, and he was grateful for its absence. The sight of it was a reminder of how short-sighted their new farseer truly was. He sighed again and wondered if this time he would see their promised salvation rising from the sea that had imprisoned his people so long ago. This story by Ken Scholes is one of the three original stories in Robots Through the Ages. When Brian Thomas Schmidt talked to Ken about writing a new story, Brian was interested in Ken's series that starts with Lamentation about the robot Isaac. And Ken was trying to come up with a story that would fit well with the published work in the series but wouldn't complicate any of his ongoing storylines, and suddenly he realized that he could fit in a prequel, sort of an origin story of Isaac. And that's our story in this collection. It's a story of a <coughs> prophecy about a metal man who kneels facing a temple on an island where the people have been waiting for rescue for generations. And they think that the metal man is pointing out the temple and the temple will show where their rescue is coming. And it becomes a story about faith and those who have it and those who don't and those who lose it. And how each of those has a part to play in the course of this society. So that is where this fits in is the narrator is trying to carry forward the faith at a time of crisis and that time of crisis is going to lead into Ken's series starting with Lamentation which you can find at the QR code on the right. Now when I read this story I read it as science fantasy and in fact I said in a discussion with Ken that George Lucas could learn a thing from him about how to do science fantasy right, because I thought his, his mix of magic, faith, and science was a wonderful mix. And Ken said, well, actually, no, it's not fantasy. It's all science, if you look through the rest of the series. So that's something to look forward to this. So if this is what Ken's doing with his science, he is managing to make it, integrate into the culture so well that it feels like part of the faith.
Twice more, Tovin climbed the steps and knelt to watch and pray, and each time he was met by cold silence. He wasn't sure what he had expected, but not silence. And when midday came and went, and when the small scattering of his faithful finally dispersed, Tovin fought the urge to weep again. I think, Captain Ramey said as she gave the metal man a withering glare, it's time to become our own salvation. Then she looked to her daughter. When Anna left the temple with her mother, Tovin knelt alone beside the object of his faith and closed his eyes. The tears came in silence, and in his mind he saw the tree upon the plain as the wind stripped its seeds and threw them to the sky. Spirit of long ago, rise up like wind to carry me home. But no wind came, and outside the rain began to pour. And here we have the conflict between Tovin, who wants to believe, but may no longer be able to, and Captain Ramey, who just wants to do what's right for guiding the people. No villains here, just conflicting visions. Who is right? Read the story, and then read Lamentation. I'm not going to review our last story in Robots Through the Ages. Today I know, because it's written by me. And while I may have a bit of an ego, I do not have enough ego to review my own story. But I will read the opening and then talk to you about some of the important issues raised in it. This is a sequel to my story, Today I Am Paul. It is, I think the term I've heard sometimes is inquell, a story that happens within this time frame of another story. Call it an inquell to my novel, Today I Am Carrie. This happens between the events of that book because it's an 80-year story, the novel is. There's time for smaller stories to happen within it. And I was honored that Brian asked me for one. And then I had to come up with one. And I came up with this, and I hope you enjoy it. Today, I stand in front of the Parker House, trying to think of another option. I see none within the limits of my programming. I must act. I am in my neutral form as I approach, a nondescript android with simple facial features, not emulating any person. Veronica knows me in this shape, so I will not surprise her. I step up to the door and push the buzzer. The door screen lights up with an animated orangutan. Can I help you? The computer asks. I am Carrie Owens. I would like to speak with Veronica Parker. The orangutan picks its teeth with one long finger. Finally, it says, Miss Parker will be here shortly. I pass the first hurdle. She will talk to me. For those who haven't read Today I'm Paul or Today I'm Carrie, this narrator, Carrie Owens, is an android with two unique abilities. It can sense emotions and analyze them and understand what you are feeling. And also, it can pretend to be you or some other person whom it has met. And so if it understands you well, it can pretend to be you well. And it uses these abilities early on to comfort and care for an Alzheimer's patient whose family can't always come and visit, so the android pretends to be them. And you can't pretend to be somebody without understanding them well and understanding how the disease is affecting them just as much as the patient. And so Carrie's limitation, it gains the name Carrie in the novel, Carrie's limitation is it understands these, but it is a legal medical device operating in a future United States of America where we have the health insurance privacy something something, the, the law we call HIPAA, which protects your medical records so that only you and your doctor have access to it. If Carrie has diagnosed a condition that you are suffering from, it can't tell anybody else without your permission. But it can talk to you and it can listen. And this is why editor Brian Thomas Schmidt wanted to include this story, especially when he read it. 
he'd asked for a carry story. The particular carry story was important to him once he'd read it. And this is why he asked, and I agreed, to dedicate the story to Allie Doss and Sarah Perdue. And a spoiler for my own story, this story is about a young woman contemplating suicide and what Carrie can and cannot do to try to help her. Sarah Perdue was a young woman with a lot of joy in life and a lot of sadness and eventually took her own life. And her mother, Allie Doss, was understandably devastated by this. But after she had time to pick herself up and to try to come to grips with this, she decided that one of the things she could do is try to help others in this situation and others who aren't in it yet, to try to help start the conversations that might make a difference in a young person's life. And she created the organization Speak Up, Break the Silence in concert with the parents of another suicide victim. Their QR code is over on the right to take you to there, to learn about what they do, to see the resources they have to help you if you're in trouble or to help you understand if someone who's going through troubles. And when Ms. Doss read this story, she said, yes, that's what we're trying to do. Yes, this is the message we want to get out. And so I'm not going to tell you anything more about my story, but I hope if you have trouble of your own, you reach out to Speak Up or Suicide Hotline or a friend. And if you are someone who is a friend, who gets reached out to, listen, talk to them. Don't try to fix people, but try to be there for them. It can make a difference. Robots Through the Ages wraps up with an afterward and recommended reading list by co-editor Brian Thomas Schmidt, where he talks about how robots became important to him in an experience that may be familiar for those of us of a certain age. For me, like many others of my generation, the first time I really imagined robots could be real and got excited about them was the summer of 1977 when I first saw C-3PO and R2-D2 on the movie screen in George Lucas's Star Wars. I've been a fan ever since, and it has been amazing to watch how far we've come in my lifetime. We now have robot vacuums, robot mechanics, robot bomb sniffing dogs, robot pilots, robot cars, robots with emotions like data from Star Trek The Next Generation, and even AI assistants like Siri and Alexa. A professor of robots, robotics at CMU even has a robot to mow his lawn like Avram Davidson imagined. Some robots come to resemble humans more and more every day. Besides being a good friend, Brian Thomas Schmidt is an author in his own right who has produced a number of books that I have enjoyed and has got more coming. He is also an experienced editor and anthologist. As an editor, he has worked on The Martian by Andy Weir. He has worked on other books for various authors, but he's especially known for his work in anthologies, um, has produced some of the more interesting recent media tie-in anthologies, such as Predator books, X-Files books, and he also has done great anthologies that look at the history of topics within the field, much like Robots Through the Ages, and look at various topics, how they might be approached yet today. An example is the Mission Tomorrow anthology from Bain that he put together, and you'll recognize the names Silverberg and Cooper on that list, on that cover. Jack McDevitt, one of my author friends and one of my chief influences, one of the men who got me back into writing after a many decade hiatus. Um, Mike Resnick, another of my mentors. Um, 
and I think Mike is is been one of the biggest influences on many careers. James Gunn is a phenomenal historian of science fiction as well as an author. Ben Bova was a longtime editor of Analog Magazine and also has written some very, very inspirational hard science fiction stories that were another influence for my own writing. Michael Flynn is another longtime master of the field. And these and more are in Mission Tomorrow, one of Brian's many anthologies that he has edited. Brian then follows with a list of other robot stories you may appreciate, some of which were too long for this collection, some of which have been reprinted more recently in other places, various reasons why we could not possibly do every great robot story of the past century and more. But Brian and Robert Silverberg are happy to point you toward them. So this has been my collection of reviews for these stories. I was so happy to read this collection, some of which I knew before, to see where I was standing in my little corner of the history of robot stories. I have a corner. This book has a gamut. Thank you all.